Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where everyone is in the world. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar and panel discussion uh, entitled Bridging Research to Practice with Visual Scene Displays. My name is Franklin Smith, and I'm Executive Director of Isaac, and I am so thrilled and excited to uh, be with everyone this evening. Um, this is a very exciting event for us, and uh, this event this evening uh, is going to be an extremely interesting one and represents uh, a first of its kind for Isaac in that uh, it's a panel discussion that we're presenting tonight, and I think we have what we could call definitely a power panel this evening. Um, tonight's webinar is being proudly presented by, of course, Isaac International, but also our very good friends at Attainment Company. And Attainment Company is also our very generous sponsors for Conference 2020 and International AAC Awareness Month, which is this month in October. So again, welcome and a big shout out and a big thank you to our friends at Attainment and at this point i am going to hand it over to my good friend joni nygaard of attainment company who will be presenting uh, or introducing um, this evening's panel so joni take it away joni you should uh, please unmute yourself please so excited Unmute. There we go. Nobody's more excited than I am for this evening's panel discussion. And um, I so appreciate the opportunity to represent Attainment Company this evening. And as they are going to present bridging research to practice with visual scenes display, I quick want to make an announcement on behalf of Attainment Company. So I think the next slide will um, identify that we have specials this month, and it is. Uh, Go Talk Go, Go Talk Select, and super exciting, the new Go Talk Duo. The Duo has two messages. They are on sale this month, so check out the flyers and the sale prices for these hardware units. And tonight, as a result of um, hearing some information about uh, visual scene displays, you might want to check out the apps yourself. For the first time ever, Attainment is putting the apps on sale starting today, a kickoff for half price for Go Talk Now and Go Visual through the 31st of October, all in celebration of AAC Awareness Month. We again wanna thank tonight's presenters and I'm so excited to introduce and turn over the microphone to these ladies. Um, the presenters, Selena Babb, Jessica Caron, Namisha Mutaya, Christine Holyfield, Emily Lavisher, and Michelle Therian come to us from all parts of the United States and the world. And we are delighted um, to hear more information about visual scenes. So please uh, stay tuned. And Christine, if you wanna take it away and explain to folks what a visual scene is, um, I believe the format for tonight will be, um, each panelist will present approximately eight minutes. There'll be a time for questions and answers at the end. And we hope that as we go, if you have questions, please feel free to chat, um, jot them in the chat room. And a huge shout out, thank you to the moderator, Jessica Carone, who will um, compile and run the question and answer session towards the end of the um, seminar. So we appreciate your attendance tonight. Please feel free and celebrate uh, AAC Awareness Month in your part of the world in any way that you can to help provide people a voice as we follow Isaac's theme in bridging the silence through solidarity. Thank you. And Christine, Dr. Christine Holyfield from our University of Arkansas. Christine, you need to unmute. 
Okay. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. Okay. So as Joni graciously mentioned, I'm Christine Holyfield. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas studying augmentative and alternative communication and um, using a lot of the apps at attainment and elsewhere to look at visual scene displays and how we can support individuals with limited language uh, who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. I think I can speak for everyone on the panel to um, really just offer thanks to Attainment and Joni for sponsoring this talk. We love the opportunity to connect with clinicians and other stakeholders out in the world. And um, we thank Attainment and Isaac for uh, allowing us to connect with you all tonight. So we're happy to be here um, in AAC Awareness Month. I'm gonna offer just a quick overview of what visual scene displays are, if those are new concepts to any of you, and um, just talk about them in terms of how, why those of us on the panel think they're important to research and think they apply to clinical practice. And um, then from there, we'll get into some exciting research studies from each of the panelists in which visual scene displays were used. Um, so first, you'll see on this first slide of example of a screenshot of what a visual scene display can look like. So this is an example of a little guy who uses AAC, who is in the early stages of learning language, um, who really enjoys playing basketball. So in this scene, um, his speech language pathologist or researcher or family member would capture a photo of him playing basketball. And then that photo can serve as uh, the representation for augmentative and alternative communication for the little guy to communicate. And so um, the photo is embedded with hotspots. So you see the circles around the individual and around the hoop. So um, these are where we would program vocabulary onto the photo. So for instance, around the area of the photo where the little guy is, is hanging out maybe you would have his name and then uh over the photo where there's a hoop, a hoop and a net maybe you would say score or basket or whatever vocabulary you think would be meaningful to the individual uh, so in this way when we embed hot spots of language into photo visual scene displays what we're really doing is we're mapping vocabulary onto meaningful context that individuals can use to communicate. And um, in that way, we're relating the concept that we're wanting the individual to communicate, and sometimes we want the individual to learn um, with other things around it that are meaningful and familiar to the learner. Uh, and so the visual scene display can really serve as a graphic metaphor in that way. So uh, there are several advantages to visual scene displays. So one thing that is important for individuals who have limited language is that we're minimizing as many demands as possible. We want to promote uh, effective learning around language and communication and promote uh, participation. And one way we can do that is lessen other demands. And so sometimes when we're offering an AAC system to an individual, it can uh, create just one more thing that someone who maybe has limited attention or um, limited uh, joint referencing skills to have to reference in order to participate successfully. So the individual has to uh, reference themselves, partners, the activity, whatever it may be, like a book or a video, and then also the AAC system. So one really nice thing about visual scene displays is that instead of having the context or activity and the AAC separate, we can integrate the two and really support uh, infusing language and communication into the activity to just lessen the demands for uh, switching attention between an activity and an AAC device. So in addition to the traditional visual scene displays, which are color photos of events, people, and things from a person's life that are meaningful and familiar to them, we also can use video visual scene displays. So rather than a static photo, we can add in the dynamic nature of video 
And then uh, when we choose to pause the video, we can embed hotspots just like we would on a visual scene display. In fact, the paused portion of the video almost becomes a visual scene display upon which we can embed hotspots and language. So for instance, this is a gentleman who uh, works at a store in retail and uses some video VSDs for support with that. And so he can have um, videos that, uh, just like video prompting, really model the different aspects of a task. And then within that, when we add in the VSD piece, the visual scene display piece, not only can that video serve as a model, uh, but it also can allow opportunities for communication. So while he's watching the step that he needs to complete, uh, he can then communicate something related to that step, such as, I'm going to put the backpacks in the storage room. Another feature that can be added to visual scene displays is uh, the, uh, the addition of dynamic text. And so we've talked about hotspots, which are just communication that we embed with voice output that we as the communicator record. Um, and now with apps like Go Visual from Attainment and others, we can now also add dynamic text that's paired with the voice output. So uh, for this individual, you see a visual scene display, it's a little bit cut off, but maybe siblings holding hands and uh, the brother over here on the swing is named Nate. And so when we program the word Nate for the individual to communicate about his brother, then uh, as we select that hotspot, um, the te text representation of the word Nate will emerge from the hotspot in tandem with the voice output emerging from it as well. And so this is just an added feature that in addition to supporting language and communication, we can begin to support literacy development as well uh, in the sense of uh, promoting single word reading. And there's been several studies that have researched that and Dr. Karen later in this webinar is going to give you an example of that. So just to kind of summarize and um, be a little bit of a harbinger for about your, what you're about to hear for the rest of today, um, there are a lot of clinical applications of visual scene displays to research. So we can use visual scene displays to support communication, to support play, to support literacy, to support work, and to train communication partners. And um, most of the examples that we're going to talk about today are focused on the high-tech side of things, but there's no reason why we can't use low-tech VSDs as well in the form of printed photos, and Dr. Mattia is going to talk about that with us this evening. And again, we can include videos when they're helpful, or not when static photos work as well. Um, and just to reiterate with the visual scene displays, one big advantage of that is we're integrating communication and language into an activity uh, or task in the case of video to support communication while lowering demands. So there are a few apps available right now that support, oh, sorry. There are a few apps available right now that allow us to use visual scene displays and create them really quickly and easily. So one really nice thing about visual scene displays is we can use our mobile technology or devices to, with their onboard cameras to snap photos and then those become the context around which we're communicating or take videos. So while I mentioned that VSDs can be low tech, uh, and again, we'll hear more about that a little later. Um, they're also, they're mostly high tech and may or may not contain video. And here are just a few apps that allow that. So we've got Infotech app, which is easy VSD. We've got Attainment, uh, Attainment Companies app, which is Go Visual, which I hear is half off. And we've got Snapscene from Toby Dynavox. These are all apps that allow us to quickly and easily make and edit and program visual scene displays. And so that's it for a little overview. Uh, I'm 
looking forward to you all hearing how specific research studies that have been conducted really relate back to the uh, functionality and benefits of VSDs that I just went over really briefly. And it's my honor to announce that the next panelist to be speaking is Michelle Therian, an assistant professor at Florida State University, and she'll be discussing supporting peer interaction for children with communication needs using VSDs. Okay, I got it to work. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Christine Holyfield. I really appreciate that um, introduction. As she mentioned, I am an assistant professor at Florida State University, where I run the AAC Connect Lab. Um, most of my research is on peer interaction for preschool age children with complex communication needs. So that's what I'm gonna share with you tonight. Just for dis disclosure, um, there are three different studies that I'm talking about in this um, in this presentation, and they have been funded um, in part by the Hintz Family Foundation at Penn State University, the Ash Foundation Student Research Grant in Early Childhood Language, and the Ash Foundation's New Investigators Research Grant. Okay, so. Um, I don't think that I often need to persuade people that social relationships are important to all of our lives, but if you need a little persuasion, uh, we know from research that social relationships and interactions with peers improve both physical and mental health. Uh, and they also um, provide benefits to cognitive and language development. So that really means it falls within our wheelhouse as SLPs to consider these social relationships and how communication impacts them and how they impact communication. Um, these relationships also, of course, reduce, reduce risks for social isolation and depression and poor school performance. So they really are quite important. What we also know is that children with complex communication needs really don't do a lot of communicating with peers, even when they are in classrooms that are inclusive, where the whole you know, justification for inclusion, right, is that we want kids with disabilities to be with all the other kids and to learn in the same way and to communicate and, and to just be a part of everything. Um, and yet, they're still not a part of it, that their communication with the, their classmates is just, it just doesn't happen. Um, they have trouble using language to establish and maintain those friendships, even at a very young age. So at preschool is what I'm talking about. Um, and without intervention, without so, us doing something, they're really at risk for that social isolation. Okay, so um, the social interaction intervention components that I'm going to talk about are, they fall within child-specific, peer-mediated, and environmental arrangement. And all child-specific means is that we're going to teach the child something. We're doing something to change um, the child's skills and abilities. Um, peer-mediated means we're also training and teaching the peers to do something. Um, and then environmental arrangement, of course, means that we're creating an environment that supports these interactions. So in the case of these three studies, the child-specific and peer-mediated components were combined into a dyadic training. So the child with complex communication needs and the peer were taught the same skills together, which feels really important when your ultimate goal is friendship so that we're not setting these peers up to be special helpers or um, someone who's gonna provide assistance and we're not setting up the child with a disability to be the person who's receiving assistance all the time. Really they're learning together how to make the interaction work. And then the environment, environmental arrangement components are um, the fact that we're doing this within a picture book context and that we're providing AAC so that they have a way to communicate with each other. 
So I'm actually going to start by discussing the environmental arrangement components. So first, the picture book context. Well, what we like about this is that it creates a structure for the interaction. It gives the two children something fun and motivating to talk about, as long as you pick fun and motivating books. And then it also gives them a common vocabulary. So, you know, it's not this free play situation where you have to predict every word that someone might want to say. The vocabulary is more constrained to things that are relative to the book. It's pointing things out that are in the book. It's talking about the characters. Um, it's relating the book to your own life. And within all of those concepts, we have a pretty good guess at what vocabulary we're going, going to need to program. So then the second component of that environmental arrangement is the provision of AAC. So we're all here because we're talking about visual scene displays. And as Dr. Holyfield mentioned, the benefit of the VSD for this, for this particular study and for this reason of social interaction is that it really does embed the communication within the activity. So in this case, you don't have to share your attention between a book and the iPad or the um, other AAC device and the peer. Now we're taking one of those out so that the book and the AAC device are one and the same. And we, the two children can then look at that together, bringing their attention to the same activity and object. Um, of course, it also has voice output, which is helpful when we're talking about peers. We're not expecting them to read or understand a symbol. They can just hear the words spoken. Um, let's see, the VSDs have that support for vocabulary learning, certainly, as we're seeing the picture and then hearing the message spoken out loud. Um, and the iPad itself and th this app in particular really does make it fun and motivating for peers. So we don't have to really teach them that you need to model the use of AAC and yet modeling happens because they want to engage with the iPad and the VSD. Okay, so within that VSD, um, and Dr. Holyfield mentioned this a little bit too, what we're programming is not the words from the book. What we're programming is things that kids might say when they were looking at books together, right? So I made it my rules that the hotspots needed to be both fun and functional. So they had to, you know, be exciting and have things like sound effects or character voices, really exaggerated emotion, or even silly words like uh-oh or hooray. Um, and that makes it fun, right? It makes the kids want to touch these hot spots to engage with each other. But then they also need to be functional. So I wasn't programming only a sound effect onto a hot spot. It also had to communicate some idea. And so to make it functional, these hot spots either asked or answered questions about the book, things like, what is he doing? Um, or called attention to a different part of the picture or even related the picture to the child's experience. Of course, in order to program something like that, you have to know a lot about the child's experience. Um, but there are some things that you can also kind of guess, right? Like, oh, I love dogs. Like that could be a part of it for many children, not all. Um, so this particular hotspot right here on Little Blue, um, you, can, you can hear it. Oh no, it's not working probably because here comes little blue. Beep, beep. So you can see that one was just calling attention to a part of the picture and then adding that sound effect to make it more fun. Okay, now that, that group interaction training where you're training, teaching the child with complex communication needs and the peer together. And it's really, we're, we're talking about three to five-year-old children. So I'm not teaching them something super complex. I'm really just teaching them that when, when you're looking at the iPad with your friends, you have to share. So in order to do that, you show your friend something in the book and you tell them something about it. But after you're done, then you have to wait so that they can take a turn too. So you're working on that communicative turn-taking and also 
encouraging the peer to jump in and touch the iPad as well, touch those hotspots on the VSD. Okay, so in the late, in the most recent research study that I've been working on, I'm also working on teaching teachers how to do this within their whole classroom. So it's a um, circle time kind of intervention where the teacher comes in and follows this mnemonic to teach the children how to use the iPad with their friends. Um, and then they and then they would go and do that during, you know, center time when a couple of kids are in the book or literacy center, then they might be able to use the iPad, but they have to learn how to do that, how to learn how to use those VSDs to communicate with each other during circle time. And so what I ask the teacher to do is introduce with enthusiasm, be really excited about today, we're gonna read books together and we're gonna talk about them. Um, the teacher models the skill, so she touches a hot spot and you know, reacts to it with a big reaction. And then she passes it around the circle, encouraging every pair of children in the circle to be a team and to take one turn and then wait and then their partner takes the turn and then wait. And so that's that assisted practice where the teacher is really providing um, support and scaffolds so that the children can be successful in that take a turn and wait. Um, usually it's the wait that they need more help with. Um, and then the teacher provides feedback on that, like, oh, you waited so nicely, now it's your turn, um, and things like that to really support um, the students in both taking turns and waiting. Uh, then the last two are kind of to complete the mnemonic, but she lets the, the children know that the iPad with the visual scenes are going to be available in that center and that in order to play with it or in order to read together, they have to have a buddy. They can't just look at it by themselves. Okay. Um, so the last thing is just showing you a little bit about what happens when we teach this skill. Um, Dr. Karen, you do not have to play this whole video. A little portion should be enough. Okay. I might talk over it a little bit. Um, so this is what happened before we did the training. They have all their books. They're looking at the books. You can see that he actually has his own AAC device, although he never uses it. He's trying to engage her. She doesn't know what to do or how to communicate with him. So she continues to read her book and he continues to read his book. And it continues like this for 10 minutes. Okay. And then after the training, you will notice right away how their interaction changes. The boy is In the interest of time, we can probably stop it. But I think um, I think it's clear how much they've changed, right? They're both using the iPad to communicate, although she uses her spoken words just as much, if not more. Um, and she listens to what he's saying. So when he touches something, she goes to that page in the book and she responds to him. Um, and so that's what we really wanna see to build those social relationships.
I think that's all I have. So I'm going to pass pass it to um, Dr. Lobsher, who is, oh, doing video VSD to support interactive play between children with autism and their peers. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Therian. I should um, clarify. So I, I'm Emily. I should clarify. I'm not yet a doctor. I'm uh, a fourth year doctoral student at Penn State. Um, and I'm really excited to be here talking about um, some of the work that I've been doing, looking at using video VSDs to support interactive play between children with autism spectrum disorder and peers. I have a few funding disclosures. Um, so this work was supported in part by the Penn State AAC Leadership Project, by a graduate student research grant from the Organization for Autism Research, and a grant from um, the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research to the RERC on AAC. So why do we care about play? Um, well, it turns out play with peers during childhood is a really important context for learning a number of different things. Among those things are vocabulary, complex language structures and rules of conversation, so some language skills. Um, it's also a really important context for learning things like sharing, turn-taking, and social problem-solving. And it's an important context for forming friendships. So when we're talking about children with autism spectrum disorder, um, these children tend to have a few um, areas of difficulty that can impact their participation in play with their peers. So children with autism tend to have difficulty with both functional and symbolic play. So oftentimes they may not necessarily know how to play with toys. Um, even when those toys are available and they're there with their peers, they might just not be sure what to do, or they might play in um, idiosyncratic ways that the peer might then not be sure how to engage with that child. And children with autism also tend to have challenges with social communication. So in play interactions with peers, they oftentimes have difficulty communicating about the play as they're playing. And because of these difficulties, children with autism are at risk for exclusion from interactive play with peers, and therefore they're also at risk for missing out on the learning opportunities that play affords. So um, I'm going to talk about a study in which I used video VSDs as a potential solution for these problems. So the reason why video VSDs offer such promise um, is that we have kind of two components to the video VSDs, as um, we heard in the introduction. So we have a video component, which in the case of play can provide a video that serves as a model for how to play. So the video can show play actions or play sequences similar to traditional video modeling, which is um, an evidence-based practice for supporting play in children with autism. And then we also have the embedded VSD with hotspots to support communication about that play activity. So we're kind of using the video VSD to support both areas of difficulty that can impact um, participation in play interactions for kids with autism. So um, the research question that I was interested in for the study that I'm going to present was what is the effect of a video VSD intervention on communication and play for children with autism during play interactions with their peers with typical development? So I really wanted to know, can we use these video VSDs to support both of these potential areas of difficulty, play and communication, simultaneously so that we can enhance these play interactions between children with autism and their peers? So I'm going to talk about one study that I did. Um, and this particular study had six child dyads that participated in the study. So there were six children with autism, um, four with severe autism and four with mild to moderate autism. All of these participants had limited speech. So they all benefited from AAC. And there were also six peers with typical development. And the children were paired into dyads. So each dyad was one child with autism and one peer. The average age of the participants was about six and a half. Uh, they ranged from about five and a half years to nine years. And this study was conducted in the two elementary schools attended by the participants, and all of the study sessions took place in quiet areas that were separate from the children's classroom. 
In this study, I used two types of materials. So first of all, there were the toys that the dyads used to play with. And then there were video VSDs that supported each of the toy sets. So um, the toys were selected based on dyad interests. So um, I talked to people who were familiar with the children and just kind of tried to figure out what would be fun and motivating for both of the kids within the dyad. And then based on those discussions, selected one toy set per dyad. I ended up using three toy sets in the study. Several of the dyads used the same toy set. So I used a car garage, which included a kind of parking structure and a couple of wooden cars. There was a, a pets activity, which included some stuffed pets, a cat and a dog, and some um, kind of materials for taking care of the pets. And then there was a set of plate food. And then there were video VSDs to support play with each of these different play sets. So um, in this case, the video VSDs were created using the GoVisual app. Um, there were five video VSDs per toy set and a total of 10 hotspots per toy. Within the video VSDs, the video part modeled play actions that the children could do related to that toy. And these play actions included an important role for both children. So I really wanted to support interaction between the children. Um, and not just just the child with autism to be able to play. I wanted the children to be playing together. So my video models included an important role for both kids. And then the hotspots within the video VSDs provided language concepts that were related to the toys and also appropriate for beginning communicators. So I have a couple of examples of the video VSDs that I used. The first example shows one of the video VSDs for the car's toy, and you'll see the video play, and then it will pause, and you'll see the hotspots that were programmed. Drive. Oh, I think that last part cut, got cut off a little bit, but the hotspots were drive and crash. And then the second example uses the play food set. So just as Dr. Therian was talking about, I tried to incorporate some language concepts that would be fun for the kids to use con uh, comments such as uh-oh um, and crash as well as functional concepts. So during the study, these are the procedures. There was a baseline phase, which was before we provided any intervention. During this phase, the children within the dyad took turns choosing a particular set of props from their playset that they wanted to play with. They were given those props. They had a period of time to play together, and they had no video VSDs available. And then during the intervention phase, after we introduced the intervention, the children again took turns choosing props to play with. They were given the, the props that they chose. And now they also had access to a video VSD that showed them how they could play with those toys and what they could talk about um, as they played. The children also received some instruction to teach them how to use the video VSDs as they played together. So during the instruction sessions, the children again took turns choosing toys. Once the toys were provided and a video VSD was available, the children were provided with least to most prompting to both complete the play action following the video model and also use at least one of the hotspots to communicate. The variables for the study, that independent variable was the treatment package. So we had the video VSDs and also the instruction that the children received. And then the primary dependent variable, which is the thing we were measuring and what we were interested in looking at mainly, was the number of turns in which the child with autism both demonstrated either a functional or symbolic play, so some kind of functional or symbolic play, and also communicated with their peer. And the communication couldn't just be um, uh, it had to be specifically directed toward the peer. So we were really looking for that kind of interaction among the dyads or between the children in each dyad. So these are the results. The graphs are very busy, but um, the main kind of take home from this is that five out of the six participants with autism, um, after going through the intervention and receiving that instruction um, and using the video VSDs, five out of these six children experienced an increase in the number of turns in which they both communicated with their peer and also engaged in functional or symbolic play. And
And I, um, oh, and just uh, out of those five participants who made gains, all of them demonstrated large or very large effect sizes. So we're really seeing some nice progress for most of these participants after learning how to use the video VSDs and having them available to support play, we're seeing more interactive play with their peers and also more communication with the peers. So both of these areas of difficulty seem to be being supported. And I apologize that I don't have a video example to show the, um, any of the dyads uh, playing together after learning to use the video VSDs. I had limited permission to share videos from this study. Um, so I apologize for that. But I have uh, just some quick kind of tips and take home points. So um, this study should be considered preliminary, but it does suggest that the video VSD intervention might help to increase the number of turns in which children with autism demonstrate functional and symbolic play and also peer-directed communication. And some clinical tips that I would suggest based on this work would be, first, if you're creating video models in a context like this to support play, I would consider choosing actions and sequences that include an important role for both children, so you're really supporting that interaction between them. Um, and I would also recommend choosing language concepts that are appropriate for the learner's age and stage of language development, um, and also fun, again, as Dr. Thering was talking about. So um, don't forget about fun concepts like sound effects. Um, those were a big hit in this study. And I think that, that's it for me. So next I'll um, pass it along to Dr. Namisha Mutia um, for the next topic. Hi everyone, really excited to be here and be a part of this panel discussion. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about low-tech visual scene displays, which is a little bit different to what um, the others have been talking about so far. Um, so um, my study that I'm going to talk about is focusing on low-tech visual scene displays and a training that I did for paraprofessionals. Uh, so very quickly, um, I don't really have any disclosures to um, disclose. Uh, so I want to uh, talk a little bit, give a, a quick introduction to what low-tech visual scene displays are. Um, there's already uh, research that's out there talking about the use of low-tech visual scene displays uh, with adults who have acquired conditions. Um, and over the last few minutes, you've also heard uh, about the use of um, VSDs in general, uh, mostly high-tech uh, with children who have complex communication needs. Um, so uh, there's uh, an emerging body of research now that's also talking about the use of low-tech visual scene displays uh, with children who have complex communication needs. Okay, so um, before I jump in and talk about uh, the study itself, I wanna uh, just quickly say that um, there may be certain contexts or um, certain situations where it isn't possible to use high, tech, um, high technology or you may not have access to that. Um, and so in those kinds of situations, um, I think using low-tech visual scene displays uh, could be a really nice solution. Um, and also in contexts like if you're playing outside or if, if, uh, if the child is playing with water. Uh, and in, in those kinds of contexts, then it will be really appropriate to use low-tech VSDs. Um, so we know that paraprofessionals play really an important role in supporting individuals who have complex communication needs in a school setting. Um, but we also know that not many paraprofessionals um, receive specific training on communication um, strategies. Um, so my current study focused on training a group of paraprofessionals um, who worked in a school. Uh, and the paras specifically trained on the use of low-tech visual scene displays as a tool. Uh, and they were also trained to provide communication opportunities. I'm going to spend a little more time talking about the kinds of communication opportunities they were trained to provide. So very specifically, the paraprofessionals in the study were trained to provide what I, what I term as evocative communication opportunities. Basically, these kinds of communication opportunities place the individual or the child in a more um, active role, a more uh, um, 
communicatively active role. And so evocative communication uh, opportunities can be defined as either asking an open-ended question, so not a yes, no question, um, making a comment or providing an opportunity for a choice. Uh, and in, a, in addition, then we provide the child with some type of a means uh, to respond and then waiting uh, for a response back from the child. Uh, so talking a little bit about the kind of kinds of participants um, in this study. Um, so the paraprofessional participants, they had a wide range of experiences, like some had just um, started working for less than a year, and then there were others who had worked as paras for 20 years. Um, and their special education qualifications also varied. Um, there were some who had no training at all. Um, in terms of the child participants, since the study was done as a dyad. Um, so the student participants, they ranged in age from six years to, to 21 years. Uh, they had a variety of diagnoses. Um, however, majority of the children in the study were at a pre-symbolic level. Um, there were only two children who had, who had some words and were using a few signs. Uh, so talking a little bit about the method um, that I used in this study, uh, it was an interrupted time series um, quasi-experimental design. Um, the independent variable that um, I used was basically training the paras, the provision of the training, um, as well as the use of low-tech visual scene displays. And the dependent variable or the thing that we measured in the study, uh, the, the primary dependent variable was the number of evocative communication opportunities that the paraprofessionals provided. And uh, the secondary dependent variable was the number of communication turns that were taken by the students. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the training itself. Um, the, the training was a group training and um, it was fairly quick. It was only about two and a half to three hour quick training that, that I did. Um, and the content of the training, one of the main things that I considered was uh, the needs of the learners or what the paraprofessionals themselves uh, wanted to learn about. Um, and uh, the training followed principles of adult learning, so providing them opportunities to uh, actively participate in the training, um, giving them situations that they could relate to, that they um, experienced every day, um, in wh while working with the children with complex communication needs. Uh, so following the group training, um, I did three individual follow-ups with each of the paraprofessional um, student dyads in their classrooms. And those individual follow-ups were um, fairly quick, like between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, and then there were three of those follow-ups that I, that I did. So it was a training package that consisted of the group training uh, as well as the individual uh, follow-ups. So here are some photographs from the training. So you can see that um, uh, a part of the training uh, involved the paraprofessionals developing their own low-tech uh, visual scene displays. Um, and so you can see them uh, making the low-tech visual scene displays here. So I also wanted to share uh, a few examples of uh, what the, the low-tech visual scenes look like. So you can see, uh, um, as uh, uh, it was discussed before uh, by uh, Dr. Emily, and, sorry, by Emily and uh, Dr. Therian um, and uh, Dr. Holyfield. So uh, the pictures contained the individual with complex communication needs themselves and really fun and motivating context for them to talk about. Um, yeah, we can move on. So I'm going to show uh, a quick video. The video is actually uh, just of the post training. Um, uh, so uh, due to time, I didn't uh, share a pre pre training video. Um, so you can see in this video, um, 
ESA communicating with her paraprofessional. Um, the paraprofessional um, is using the low tech visual scene displays and providing those kinds of evocative communication opportunities. You can see her providing a choice here um, and asking open ended questions. Um, the, um, you can really see the, the, the aspect of the low tech visual scene displays that's different to using uh, high tech visual scene displays is that interact interactive component. Um, where the child with uh, complex communication needs really gets to interact with the VSD and remove parts of it. Um, and so you can see Isa doing that with uh, the VSD that the paraprofessional shows her. We have instruments in the door. Which one do you want to play? Okay. Instruments. Okay, so you can also see the paraprofessional uh, really doing something nice there, like matching the object to the uh, symbol and, and showing um, uh, showing the child that connection as well. So just in conclusion, in terms of um, how low tech visuals in displays could be used clinically, um, so with this study. We saw a nice increase in uh, the evocative communication opportunities that were provided by the paraprofessionals, which was our main kind of goal in the study. That's what we wanted to see. Uh, but in addition to that, we also saw that uh, the children with complex communication needs um, also um, had an increase in the number of communication turns that they were taking. Um, so again, this is a preliminary study, but it showed some um, positive outcomes in terms of implementing low-tech uh, visual scene displays uh, with beginning communicators. Um, and the beginning communicators in the study really range in age as well as skill level um, and, and interest. Um, so uh, again, as I said uh, before, the, the training itself was not um, a hugely time-consuming um, training, so it was fairly quick. Uh, so the, the study does provide um, some prelim preliminary evidence for uh, this kind of a model for an effect, efficient and effective um, communication partner training. Um, so it also does provide some preliminary evidence for the use of low-tech uh, visual scene displays um, and that can be fairly easily uh, you know, printed out and developed uh, to use in, in your context. Okay, so uh, it is my great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Jessica Karen, who is an assistant professor at Penn State. Yes, thanks, Demisha. So today um, I'll be talking about using VSDs with the transition to literacy feature. And the transition to literacy feature was developed under the RERC on AAC. And um, you can go to the website and hear more about projects that are happening there. So the funding was from Nidler for this, but I have no relevant financial relationships or disclosures. So um, Dr. Holyfield did a nice introduction, a brief introduction that we can add text to VSDs. And um, a lot of our current AAC technologies pairs text with pictures, but they're paired in a static manner. And we know that this can actually interfere with word learning. 
Um, so Light and colleagues tried to reconceptualize and think about ways that we could probably support literacy learning better within our current AAC systems, and that was with the development of the transition to literacy software feature. So with this software feature, the individual is going to select a picture symbol from an AAC display. Then what happens is the written word dynamically appears on the screen. The written word is spoken by the app, so the text is paired with the symbol in the speech output, so when the text is on the screen, the device would say meteorologist. And then the image shrinks, um, the text shrinks back into the original image. Currently, there actually are uh, multiple options for the T2L feature. We actually have it in grid-based um, displays as well. It's in the NovaChat devices, and this was developed by Dave Hirschberger with Sotillo. Um, I won't be showing that today, but um, definitely check out the RERC to see more um, research and videos about that. And then what I'll be showing today is the T2L feature with VSDs um, incorporated into the Go Visual app by attainment. Like Christine mentioned, there also um, this feature is also available by Snapscene by Topi Dynabox. So I showed you kind of a um, static representation of the T2L feature appearing on the, the visual scene display with the word meteorologist. I wanted to show a video example of what this looks like. So um, on the tablet is Go Visual, and there are a bunch of photos that um, have been captured. And then I have gone in and programmed a specific um, word that I would like the individuals to learn. And when they touch the image on the screen, the word will appear and then shrink back. So the study that I'll be talking about today um, is kind of trying to address this challenge that we know literacy in schools has been very challenging. And um, we had interviewed SLPs and teachers that are working in schools with individuals who use AAC, and they're all talking about this struggle for time for literacy instruction, that time's limited, that there's really hard for SLPs to find this balance between teaching an AAC system and then also providing direct literacy instruction. And then teachers are reporting, you know, we have lots of students, we have lots of students who have different needs. Um, it's really hard to address all the needs of all learners. And basically kind of what ends up happening is there's limited time in literacy instruction. And then on top of that, there's really limited opportunities for practice. And we know that it's basically impossible to become proficient at a mental task without extended practice. So we think the T2L feature could be used in lots of different ways and today's study that I'm talking about how I kind of see it fit is ideally teachers or SLPs are still doing initial teaching of, of literacy um, including um, decoding and letter sounds and sight words and it's this practice would be um, teacher directed and the individual is getting feedback from the instructor. But like I had mentioned, everyone's reporting this kind of lack of time and limited practice opportunities. So hopefully this is where the T2L feature can come in, where we can get distributed practice or short sessions over time. So we get small sessions of T2L throughout the day and throughout the week. And then ideally at the end of the week, the teacher would do like a cumulative review of skills and knowledge that um, have been learned. And they're kind of checking in like, wow, you, you, you know, this app, with this app, you were learning X sight words, um, do we know them by the end of the week? Do we need to do more or less of these, of these words? So um, this study really is trying to figure out, can actually the T2L feature be used in this way? We have a number of studies, again, you can refer to the RERC website that has demonstrated the T2L feature is supporting single word learning for these individuals who use AAC. I was really interested in, in this context of a classroom, like can these individuals who can we really support single word reading for individuals when they're doing using the T2L feature independently and thinking about it much more as like independent practice? 
I used a single subject design and there were six participants, um, a range of diagnoses, four individuals um, in the classroom used high-tech AAC systems. Um, this was done in a high school classroom locally here and all of the individuals had been participating in um, functional word series. So that's kind of, you'll see the words that were selected based on the programs they were using. They all had some knowledge of letter sound correspondences, uh, but nobody was decoding independently. So here you'll be able to see, um, this is actually how I assessed their knowledge of the words that we selected. I used a low tech grid display and um, I would say point to pizza, point to recycle. And then the individual would touch whatever word they thought I had said. So again, um, I tried to, I got teacher input and asked them what sight words are you working on? What you know, literacy are you focusing on? And uh, in the high school classrooms I was working in, they were working on more um, functional words. And so the teachers came up with this list for me of things like restaurant and beverage and broken and restroom. So those were the VSDs that were programmed into the, to the Go Visual application. And then with the T2L feature programmed as the they selected the VSDs. So this is what everyone looked like before intervention. So basically on the graphs, what you're seeing, you should be looking before the line and um, or where the blue arrow is, and that's everyone's baseline score. So they knew maybe some of the words, but not all of them. They're pretty much at chance or below chance levels before intervention. So the intervention was basically, we want you to use this app. We want you to practice when you can. Um, we gave the instructions to the teachers. We want this practice to happen daily, but we didn't set a ton of parameters on it. Really, I wanted to see what would happen in kind of a realistic classroom setting. There was no feedback from the teachers. This task was occurring independently um, and the VSDs linked through a set of words. So what's exciting is um, you will see a nice change. Pe the students that had access to this technology over about 15 weeks started to acquire a number of sight words. And what's important to know is there was not instruction by the teachers on these words. So long term, I hope to do that where we kind of look at the teacher instructs and then this is more of a support, but we really had to isolate this variable to make sure that this independence practice people are benefiting from it. So um, they did, they did a nice job. The teachers did a great job. They used it constantly and you see a range of exposures. Some kids went through it a little faster than others or did it a little bit more, um, but we see exposures of around 200, 100 to 200 words where they're seeing that word each time over the course of the study. So again, the teachers, um, in terms of some clinical implications and ideas for you to kind of go out and use clinically, I mean, the teachers loved it. They all talked about how, um, even the parents talked about how it's really easy to use. It could be a great option in addition to direct instruction, thinking about it really in that practice model. It's just more opportunities for them to see a word. Um, Locally, we definitely see, um, depending on the classroom the kid's in, some independent reading time, but the kids that we're working with may not be able to read on their own. So this could be a great option for importing in some books and then highlighting salient high interest words that we hope that they would be learning through the T2L feature. And I'm now passing it over to Dr. Selena Babb, who's going to talk about work skills and using video VSD. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Jess. I'm just going to kind of wrap it up here and kind of take things in a different direction. And we've talked a lot about younger kids. Now I'm going to talk about how we can use video VSDs for um, adolescents and adults with um, complex communication needs. So just in terms of disclosures. Um, I use the AZ VSD app, which you'll kind of see here. And that was developed um, under the RERC by Invotech. And the rest are on there. We've kind of talked about a lot of them. Go ahead. And just to kind of get started here, 
Um, thinking about adolescents and adults, um, they don't stay in school forever, right? They have a lot of life outside of when they turn 21 or whatever the age is when they leave those school years. And we really wanted to think about what can we do to help support those individuals? Um, we know that employment is important. Employment um, impacts our quality of life. And unfortunately, less than 5% of individuals with complex communication needs are employed. And often these individuals need support not only to participate within a work activity or communi um, community activity, such as riding the bus, um, working in a business, working in a pizza shop, they also need to support to communicate within that activity. So what we wanted to know in this study is can we use video visual scene displays to support participation, so the active steps in completing a work task or community activity, and also can it help support the communication within that activity. So like I said, we want to see if video VSDs are going to work for this. And the beauty of video VSDs, which we've talked about a few times so far, is that they really capitalize on a lot of instructional methods, methods that we already know are, are effective for individuals with disabilities. So they capitalize on the use of a task analysis, which we know is effective in taking a complex task, such as riding the bus, and breaking it down into component skills. It also allows us to use video prompting, which we know is effective for individuals with autism, individuals with Down syndrome, um, complex communication needs. And with the video VSD, um, we're able to take a task and then use it um, in a video prompting method to help support the participation, the active steps of the task. And what's great about the video VSD is that we're able to embed and integrate those communicative components, the communication opportunities. Um, and they really support the context for that communication. So sometimes the individuals that we're working with are not fluent users in AAC. They may not be using an AAC, AAC system fluently. They may not have um, a lot of, they may need extra contextual support even though they're adolescents and even though they're adults. Um, so what these allow us to do is it leads, allows us to really take those um, dynamic routines of riding a bus, of working um, in a pizza shop, of working in a library, and um, capitalize on video prompting and also provide that support for communication. So um, in this study, we used um, a single subject, multiple probe across activities design. And this study just included one participant. Um, his name was James. He was 18 years old, almost 19. He um, went to a very rural school district. And James was in high school. We kind of met with the transition team. They said, OK, um, James does not use any verbal speech. He does not using an AAC system. They've tried to use one in the past. He didn't really want to do it, kind of like some training issues. Parents weren't really on board. He has a few signs for yes and no. And he's very prompt dependent. So James is very capable individual, very capable young man, um, but depends you know, solely on staff members for communication and also also to help him kind of, he needs a lot of verbal prompts to get through activities. So we met with the transition team and we said, okay, they said, we need help. James needs help in he's going to be leaving soon. We want to help him get some work skills, but he doesn't just need those participation skills. He also needs help with communicating. So we met with the team and we said, okay, let's set up the setting and the activity. Let's create a work um, environment for him. There's a need at the local elementary school library. Um, and at this library, he's going to work on several different skills. He's going to be responsible for checking in books. He's going to check out books. Um, he's going to put books away. He's going to sort books. He's going to do some, some cleaning things. Um, and this is where the context of this study is going to take place. So after we established those activities, so we said, okay, we have our setting in elementary school library. We know our activities, checking in books, checking out books, putting books away. Now we're going to go back to some of those instructional methods that we know um, are kind of foundational. So let's, putting books away, <laughs> we need to break down this task. And this is where we're going to use a task analysis. So we break down all of the steps that are necessary for James to be able to put the books away. What's each step that we're going to need to teach him? But now we remember, James doesn't just need, he doesn't just have a goal to be able to participate in the activity at work. We also want to support his communication. And we want to provide him with opportunities to practice communicating with other people at work in a dynamic setting. Um, so if you look here at this task analysis, there are um, the underlined 
lines here um, are the communication opportunities. So the entire task analysis is 11 steps and four of those steps um, are opportunities for communication because we wanna provide James with some opportunities to practice his communication skills. So just quickly, um, if you look at this graph here, we took some baseline data. So this is kind of the, the number, James was completing about 5% um, of the 11 steps, so about one zero to one step um, without any sort of intervention. So we just kind of wanted to say, what can he do um, without any support of us? What are his pre kind of, or what are the skills that he has before we provide any support for him? And in the next slide, you're gonna see a video. And what you're gonna see here um, is you're just gonna see, it's like 30 seconds of James completing like the first few steps in the task analysis. And essentially, if James doesn't complete the step within five seconds, I'm gonna step in, complete it for him, then give him an opportunity to complete the next step. Okay, it's time to put the books away. What's next? So just quickly, um, kind of what we're seeing there is that as many individuals with autism are kind of very reluctant to initiate. So we knew that James, like I said, he's a very capable individual. He likes to work, um, but is also very prompt dependent. And it's kind of, you know, very reliant on staff members to say, pick up the box, pick up the books in the box, carry the box to the table. So we already see in these baseline that he's kind of looking at the box. He kind of knows what to do, but is still waiting for, for those verbal prompts. So that was him in baseline. Now we're gonna introduce the um, video BSD app. And so back to kind of what we talked about in the terms of task analysis and video prompting. If you look at the purple square there, that's the activity of putting books away. In James user for this app, there were purple squares for checking in books, checking out, putting the books away. When he clicked on that, if you look at the black icons, those are all of the each step of those 11 steps within the task analysis. So even for those communication steps, there's a video prompt, a video model example of how to communicate, of how to pick up the tablet and go and walk close to somebody, the person that you're talking to, talking to in order to communicate with them. And this image is just an example of the step, tell a staff member you're gonna put the books away. So the video plays and then James is able to activate the blue circle, the hotspot that says, I'm going to put the books away. We can go ahead and play this one. Time to put away the books. Absolutely, go ahead and put away the books. Absolutely, let me check. So this is a quick clip, and I know it's kind of a little bit hard to hear there, um, but we hope you, you see some very big differences from the first video that we see James is actively engaged in the task, that he's looking at the tablet, he's watching the video model, the video pauses, and then he goes and completes that step. Not only the physical kind of participation, motor task acts, um, but also the communication opportunities, which is huge for an individual, an 18 year old who has not, not had an effective AAC system, not had a way to communicate, but now we see him that, you know, 
communication is important. Communication is allowing him to get his job done at work. Um, you have to stand in close proximity so that your employers, your um, other coworkers can hear you. Um, so hopefully you were able to kind of see that in that video. And I'll just take a quick minute to share a fun story. So this is elementary school. Um, all the elementary school kids love cats books, animal books, cats, dogs. And James, one of his tasks was to sort cats and dogs. And um, at one point he pulled up a, a book and it was of a hairless cat, like one of those sphinx cats. And he looks at it and he looks at me and he looks at it and he looks at me like, what the heck is this thing? Is this a cat or a dog? What is this? Um, anyway, all right, we can go ahead. So this is James Graff. Um, he did so well after he had the support. He was able to follow the video models to support not only the, his participation, but also his communication within the activity. And that, that's really clear from the data and within the graph. And then just lastly, the implications of this is that the video VSDs allow us to take what we know, that we know task analysis is effective, we know video prompting is effective, we know that individuals with complex or complex communication needs are gonna need communication supports. And the beautiful thing about video VSDs is that we're able to integrate them all together and able to provide a very effective and efficient um, support for the individuals that we work with. Thanks. So I'll be doing a quick wrap up and then we'll be opening it up for questions. Um, if you haven't had a chance to add a question, feel free to type something in now. Um, so hopefully you saw a nice range of how VSDs can be used in terms of supporting communication, play, literacy, work, um, and also training partners or peers. Um, again, VSDs can be low tech or high tech, they can have um, video or not, and really the big picture takeaway is really thinking through how we can integrate the task in communication and reduce some of these cognitive demands. Um, hopefully you all have checked out the handout and you can see more um, published work related to intervention research for using visual scene displays. And we wanted to, you know, thank all everybody who has participated in our studies and in our labs. We couldn't have done without all of these people. It takes a big crew. And um, now I will invite all of the panelists to turn on their webcams. I'm going to minimize my screen and open it up for questions. So everyone's coming on. Okay. So the, the first question, I guess I will give to um, Dr. Holyfield. And um, somebody brought up the questions, ha, question, how do you manage um, somebody who has an existing AAC system? So say, for example, like in Michelle's study where we see the kid who has an AAC system um, and then also integrating VSDs, like where, where does VSDs fit in in that scenario? I'm over two on the unmuting. All right. <laughs> Thank you for whoever asked that question. I think it's a really interesting import and important one. Um, so first of all, you know, there. Uh, one thing we know in AAC is being multimodal and having as many options for communication as possible is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And um, one of the things that is true in AAC and also outside of AAC is just with every avenue you take, there's there's a give and a take to that. So the give for visual scene displays is everything we've talked about, the opportunities for really supporting communication, language, and literacy development, as well as you know just having that rich context for learning there, language learning and for communication. Um, those are some advantages. Then of course we've got the take as well as the give. And the take with visual scene displays really is related to the fact that it's just a reality that there's only so much vocabulary that's going to be available to one person on a screen at one time on a visual scene display. And um, you know, we can have a few hot spots on there, but it's never going to offer the same level of efficiency in terms of communication as another option like a grid display when um, the individual has the vocabulary and metacognitive skills to use and navigate a grid display. 
So I think there's a lot of opportunities to use the two together. And first I'll just say that everything I'm gonna talk about is more related to um, theoretically and anecdotally what is what I believe to be valuable, not related to, there's no specific research on this to my knowledge. Um, so one thing is the transition to literacy piece, right? So um, one reason, literacy learning is good for a lot of reasons, but one reason is accessibility to AAC. So as an individual, uh, like the like those you saw in Dr. Karen's study is learning to recognize symbols, um, orthographic symbols for words, then that means that um, we can be building a bridge between what they're learning on their AAC device and the representation on a grid display. So it's very easy to make sure if they've learned a, a word through the T2L feature on a VSD, that that word shows up on their device um, for them and they'll know the representation to use it. Another option is the photo representations themselves. So um, I know with Go Visual, the app, you can copy a hotspot and then paste it into the grid display of Go Talk Now or I, I believe any grid display. And so you can really create cohesion with uh, using VSDs and using a grid system uh, that way as well. So for example, if um, you want to put if the individual has developed a new friendship at school after doing something like in Dr. Therian's study, then maybe from a VSD of the, with a photo of that child that that individual recognizes and has really learned um, to be familiar with that representation on the VSD, you can copy and paste that representation into a grid display for them to use to communicate when say on their, um, other AAC device, they go to their friends page and um, select it. And so the one of the beautiful things about photos and videos is there's not a whole lot of learning that has to happen. That's why we use them in visual scene displays. They're so accessible and inherently meaningful. And so what that means is we can use them for language learning and communication learning and then transfer that knowledge of representation learning onto a grid display without without um, any added learning like for instance if you were to teach um, two different apps one that wasn't a VSD. Um, the other thing I would just say is sometimes there's going to be different interactions where you have different goals in mind right and there's going to be sometimes when using a visual scene display uh, is going to make the most sense. Like when the individual maybe wants to share about their weekend and has a video of something really cool they did that their sibling took of them doing some cool trick on a skateboard or something, right? And they can use video VSDs to share about that with all their friends at school. Um, and then there might be other times, for instance, when they need, they need access to like a whole range of vocabulary about um, about something that they can really quickly and efficiently communicate where maybe the uh, another option makes the most sense, right? And so I think just always keeping in mind what your goals are at any given time in terms of intervention and thinking about which system is gonna be most supportive of those goals. And But it's certainly not the case that um, we always need to be picking one thing or the other. There are some individuals who might be benefiting from multiple options for communication. Great. Thanks, Christine. All right. So this question um, goes to both Michelle and Emily, and it, um, it talks a little bit about generalization of, of words that they've kind of, that hotspots have been programmed. So like the uh-oh or crash. Did Do we know anything about generalization of these words to other contexts that, so it could be other books or other play activities? Um, did you have generalization in your studies or kind of can talk broadly about that? Emily, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, so I can I can go quickly. So I did not measure generalization of the specific content, uh, uh, concepts that were in the hotspots in my study. I did look at generalization, but what I looked at was whether the participants were able to use new video VSDs for a new toy without any instruction at all. And in that case, of the five participants in my study, 
that benefited from the intervention, three of them had um, some really positive generalization data showing that they could learn to use a new video VSD um, without any additional instruction with a new toy. Um, and then I had some mixed results for two of the participants. Um, they each had two opportunities for generalization after receiving the instruction. And in one opportunity, they showed some great generalization. And in one they didn't, it's a little hard to know why that was the case. Um, but, uh, but I did not specifically look at whether they use the concepts in the study outside of the study or in a new um, context. I don't know, Michelle, if you um, are able to speak to that at all. Yeah, so like Emily, I my generalization that was built into the study was generalization to different books and also to a different context because in those first studies we were taking the kids out of the classroom to do the teaching and then we did generalization in the classroom when there were other kids around and it was much busier um, and we saw good gains there with both new books and with the new setting but we didn't look at generalization to completely different contexts or whether the children were using those vocabulary words outside of the context of our study um, we do have a planned study that COVID um, interrupted where we were at least going to look at um, kind of a do the, a similar study where we're just teaching them that social interaction within the context of storybook reading, but also measuring, doing just a pre and a post test of vocabulary to see if just that, that social interaction and that looking at the book with a peer, if through that experience, they would be learning some of the vocabulary from the book and vocabulary from the hotspots. Um, but of course, um, that study is incomplete because of COVID. So hopefully we'll get that study at some point and we'll know a little bit more about vocabulary learning from that. Great. Jessica, it's it's Franklin Smith. I'm just gonna break in for a moment because I wanna yep. let all our attendees know that we have a lot of really good questions and we don't want to we are getting close to 8 30 but we don't want to unceremoniously just stop and leave questions hanging so i want to let all our attendees know we will try and take a few extra questions we may go a few extra minutes beyond our 8 30 timeline but also very important for the attendees uh Joni Nygaard of Attainment Company has a surprise to announce. So, and you need to be here in order to be able to take advantage of that surprise. So to our attendees, if we go over a few minutes, don't leave. Okay, <laughs> take it away panelists, thank you. Okay. We'll do two more questions, but um, it's kind of along the same lines, but directed specifically to um, Selena. One of the questions was, do you have other examples of ways that you have used video VSDs to support employment? And can you just give some examples um, and talk about some ways that it's been successful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this was kind of a pilot study that we did. We had another um, doc student from Penn State, O'Neill et al, 2017 or 18, published a study where she actually used um, the video VSD in the same format to support um, an individual with autism with complex communication needs to ride the bus, um, to complete like a shredding activity at a work site. And there was one other task that they did. Um, then I kind of did this, this study with the individual at the library. And from here, we did an additional follow-up study, um, which was just published in um, AAC, BAB et al. I think it's 2020, um, where we had four individuals with complex communication needs, high school students um, working at like a food bank setting. Um, and, and again, very successful results. So that, that study was, kind of an amped up version. We had like 25 steps in the task analysis, 10 of those were communicative and a wide range of um, individuals with communication needs. Some individuals who had some speech, some who were using AAC devices, some who had no speech. And again, we're seeing um, very consistent, very positive results. Um, so definitely check out those studies. And I think our information is everywhere. Please, like if you have any questions, feel free to email me um, afterwards and we can talk more about that. 
Um, one's just kind of a practical question that I don't know um, whoever wants to kind of step up and answer. Just after you've finished this studies, how have you maybe gone about um, like integrating this into their day away from kind of the research context? Um, so sharing VSDs, are you setting up the device? Are you transferring things over? I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that. Um, so, I mean, I know, Selena, you can go, but I know we've done it there. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to say quickly with like the students that we work with, one thing that we found is a key is just kind of training the staff members. So while we're helping them at employment sites, like we have paraprofessionals there that are with them. You know, they, they have the app on their iPad. You know, we're kind of working with the school district. Attainment has been wonderful at giving us kind of like allowing us to use their apps and giving them like a discounted price or even for free sometimes. So we can, especially in rural, um, low income school districts that we work in. So definitely kind of using them and kind of setting them up with success when we leave. So even with the um, study that I had talked about where they're working at a food bank, we kind of left and then we had four students working there when we left. And by the next year, they had like six students there, then seven students and they're bringing more on. Um, so really working on training staff and then also, you know, providing the materials there or the apps or whatever they need to continue on. Great. So we'll switch over to Joni. Is she missed? Okay, I was gonna say. <laughs> no, I'm missing? No way. This was so <laughs> exciting. Thank you, thank you. I, I need to say it six times at least, but I just really, um, on behalf of Attainment Company and Isaac, we are truly uh, blessed to have all of you sharing your research knowledge with us this evening and applying that to clinical practice. I was just thinking to myself as a clinician, wow, if you miss this, you, you missed a lot of um, interactive ways in which you could change and adjust your practice tomorrow for that AAC communicator that you're serving. So thank you, um, doctors, doctors, and doctors. And as well, <laughs> Emily, you're gonna be, you're, you'll be there soon. So um, on that note, I think Franklin said I had a surprise announcement, which of course, Attainment is so honored to sponsor this webinar. And as you know, um, as of today, the apps have gone at 50%, but we would like to choose one lucky winner from this audience who has just really come through with some awesome questions and been great attendees. We would like to provide them with one Go Talk Now and one Go Visual app of their own without having to purchase it. So um, Franklin, can you do the honors? It would be my pleasure to do the honors. So uh, I want to give everyone, first of all, um, before uh, you know, before we rush and all go do the the million things that we all have to do. First of all, extend tremendous thanks to our panel this evening, ladies. You are all fabulous. Thank you very much for for pitching up like this. Um, I know I was uh i was enthralled by everyone and i can see by the questions that everyone was very all of our, our attendees were likewise engaged so thank you very much um we have uh in order to pick the winner for this evening um i first of all want to just let everyone know that uh isaac leadership isaac staff and yes, you two panelists are not eligible to win this evening. So I'm sorry, I know that's, uh, oh, sorry, and I should say also attainment staff as well are not eligible to win this evening. So we wanna make sure that there's no favoritism. Um, and because I'm an unabashed Excel geek, I will explain briefly to everyone how we actually picked the winner this evening. Um, we, uh, during the webinar, I downloaded our attendee list and generated a series of 10 random numbers between 1 and 100 for every attendee and summed all 10 of those numbers and the individual whose score came closest but did not go below the number of 660 is going to be our winner this evening. Now, you may be asking yourself, how did he pick 660? Well, 660 happens to be a number that we use for a, from a budgeting perspective here in Isaac. So 
Um, I'll just leave it at that. But uh, that is how tonight's winner has been selected. And tonight's winner, with a score of 663, is Megan Walsh. Megan, congratulations. Uh, Megan, we do have your email address. And so uh, I, I hope you will not mind. I see you just typed in yay in there. So thank you. I hope you won't mind that I share that email address with Joni. And I will leave it, Joni, to you and Megan to connect. And uh, uh, she, can, uh, she can get her prize. And Megan says, no worries, thanks. So um, I just want to, again, um, and Joni, I know, I'll, uh, I know you'll want to say thank you as well, but I just want to, again, um, thank all our panelists for this evening. Um, guys, you did an amazing job, very interesting. Um, it was, uh, from a content perspective, um, it, it was definitely uh, 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 up there with, uh, uh, with, the, with the content that we like to provide. So thank you again, and a big, big thank you um, to our very generous sponsor, Attainment Company, um, sponsoring this webinar, sponsoring Conference 2020. Um, we tremendously value our partnership, Joni, with Attainment Company, so thank you very much. And I will, um, just before I give it to you to wrap up, just remind everyone that if you have not downloaded uh, the available resources, um, the handouts for this evening, they are available as PDFs in the handouts uh, section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you also will all receive uh, within an hour after the conclusion of tonight's webinar an automated email that will point you to Isaac's website and will also point you to our post-webinar survey. We certainly would invite everyone to take two minutes to complete our survey because that's how uh, we uh, we make our hopefully make our webinars better each time. So with that, Joni, please take it away and close it out for us. Thank you. Joni, I was going to add, sorry, real quick. Um, we have in our PowerPoint or in the handout, everyone put their email address. P please feel free to touch base with us, reach out. We'll, we know we kind of crammed a lot of information to a small amount of time, so um, we're more than happy to talk with people if we didn't get to your question. Sorry, Joni. No, oh, that's fine. And um, I was just going to add, too, if you do have additional specific questions, please feel free to contact these ladies. Um, I know that I am just so honored to be able to not only um, know them as researchers, but to be able to call them a friend, um, to gather this group of people together on a night like this or a morning, Namisha, uh, depending on where you're located. Um, people are up all over the clock. We have several countries represented on the line as well. So we are just um, thrilled that we could do this. And I know that Franklin would like me to turn it back to him to talk about Isaac 2021. And that's really how I'd like to close it out is to say, I hope I get to see you in Mexico in 2021 for Isaac 2020. <laughs> so thank you all for your uh, knowledge and for sharing that with all of us. Thank you, audience, for your great questions. And I look forward to communicating with you. I did throw my email up into an answer. Um, it is joni at attainmentcompany.com. So I'm the only Joni there. So feel free to email me if you have questions. And I can always connect you with one of the researchers um, if you weren't able to find their email directly. So thank you again. And Franklin, did you want to add a little something? Thank you, Joni. You know, it's always a dangerous thing to give me the microphone. Um, but again, thank you everyone tonight. Thank you to our attendees. We literally, this was a global event um, from uh, North America all the way around the world through South Asia and China, Taiwan, uh, Australia, Sri Lanka, um, Brazil. So a tremendous, tremendous participation. And we look forward to welcoming the world God willing, everyone will be uh, safe and healthy uh, next year in uh, Cancun, Mexico. So challenging times we live in, but stay safe, stay well, everyone, and have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.